Thank you all for joining us for another weekly update on FuseNet's global COVID-19 briefing for countries that FuseNet monitors and reports on. As usual, we'll start today with the key messages. We'll then move into the state of no known COVID-19 cases. We'll provide an update on some of the data and monitoring resources we're looking at for economic impacts. And then for our countries in focus today, we'll spend some time on FuseNet remote monitoring countries, uh, countries that we have uh, somewhat uh, less reported on over these um, last few briefings. As of Sunday, there were nearly half a million known cases of COVID-19 and nearly 14,000 associated deaths reported across the 29 presence and remotely monitored countries that FuseNet covers. Uh, at the population level, vulnerability to the pandemic and measures to slow its spread have varied widely from country to country, from region to region, and even within countries. At the same time, the humanitarian and development priorities that are impacted most immediately in these countries vary by crisis and population as well. This is both in how COVID-19 and associated restriction measures are impacting food security, as well as primary drivers of acute food insecurity, um, many of which we continue to see uh, occurring through 2020, including drought, conflict, as well as other economic factors. Access to income and food remains constrained by many measures taken to slow the spread of COVID-19, both official government spread, or excuse me, government control measures, as well as community-based uh, measures that are being adopted by many. And this is impacting both rural and ur urban populations across many of the areas that we report on. We've been relying heavily on qualitative information uh, obtained by both FuseNet uh, colleagues, as well as other um, international and local uh, resources. And data from recent surveys continues to confirm these reports that we're getting from these qualitative assessments on the indirect impacts COVID-19 is having on employment, on income, and how households are gaining access to food. FuseNet expects that about 90 to 100 million people will be in need of humanitarian food assistance in 2020 across its 29 presence and remotely monitored countries. As you know, we additionally provide an estimate that includes an additional 17 non-FuseNet reporting countries and the combined number for the 29 FuseNet reporting countries as well as the 17 additional countries, um, the 46 countries in 2020 is that we expect 113 million people in need of emergency food assistance. Moving to the graph that we've been showing for the last several weeks, looking at the state of known COVID-19 cases in FuseNet reporting countries. This is looking at the seven day moving average across FuseNet countries uh, with our orange bars indicating the number of cases, the green trend line uh, looking at the seven day average of cases, and then the blue line looking at total deaths. Um, over the last several months, uh, you'll notice that we're not moving towards a peak any longer in the daily number of COVID-19 cases. However, we are continuing to see um, a, a severe level of impacts uh, from the control measures in particular on countries that we're monitoring and reporting on. If we take a step back and break out this kind of global look at uh, COVID-19 infections and death, uh, by region, we see quite a varied pattern, uh, very different from the pattern that we're seeing when we take a look at the global level. As you can see here in Asia, they continue to peak with the number of daily cases uh, that are being reported in Europe. Uh, they're moving uh, towards another increase in North America. Uh, we're coming down from a second increase in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, where FuseNet uh, monitors and reports on, uh, we're still at a very high peak. However, as you see here, the number of daily cases in Africa uh, hasn't really seen the same peak that we've seen in many other regions across the world. And um, as we've been discussing here, and I think as many have been discussing and reporting on, um, one of the expectations is that the level of testing and reporting that is occurring in some regions of the world, particularly de uh, developing regions of the world, um, has meant that we're not seeing the true level of cases and the true spike that we might have expected to see um, had we had better data. There was also an article that came out in the journal Science uh, last month that uh, posited a few other reasons why we might not be seeing uh, such a, a, a steep spike in Africa like we are seeing in other regions of the world and as we are seeing 
uh, globally, and a few of the reasons they offered um, included that the control measures in place in Africa um, took place before the likely spike in infection rate might have occurred um, in Africa otherwise. Another reason that has been indicated uh, was that because of the generally younger population that exists in Africa relative to the rest of the world, populations that become infected might ne necessarily exhibit symptoms that would bring them to go and um, take a test to identify whether or not they are uh, positive for COVID-19. And additionally, given the high uh, morbidity level or the high presence of infection um, among other diseases in Africa, it's being positive that potentially um, that frequency of rate of infection from other diseases is supporting um, the immuno response to COVID-19 and um, meaning that the infection infected cases in, in parts of Africa, particularly where there are high rates of other infections, um, is not eliciting a, a response in humans that might bring them to go to go get tested. They're not manifesting the, the disease in a way where they would go and get tested. Nonetheless, uh, despite what these trends are showing us and what the actual trends are, restriction measures remain in place uh, across the globe, including in countries monitored by FuseNet, um, to uh, limit the spread of the virus. Um, this map here is from uh, our world in data, displaying uh, data from Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. This is one of the trackers in addition to the tracker from ACLA that we've been monitoring to uh, look at a holistic kind of global scale of the level of restriction measures that are in place um, to respond to the pandemic. And as you can see here, and as we've seen over the last several months, the levels of restrictions in place vary quite uh, broadly across countries and across regions of the world, even within the monitored regions of FuseNet in Central America and the Caribbean, in East and West Africa, in Southern Africa and in Central Asia, you can see there's a very diverse spread of the level of stringency of measures that are in place to halt the spread of the virus. And as we've been discussing, it's oftentimes these uh, measures that are in place that are inhibiting households' ability to access their typical livelihoods and their typical sources of food and income. One of the things we've been seeing most prominently over the last couple of months is the impact that the restriction measures are having on the travel and tourism industry. While the travel and tourism industry uh, typically might not necessarily serve the poor populations uh, that we are typically most frequently analyzing, the people who work in this industry uh, certainly are among the populations that are uh, very vulnerable to losses to income and, and jobs. There was a report from the World Travel and Tourism Council uh, recently that presented uh, three scenarios on the potential impact on the tourism and travel uh, sector globally. Um, and those, those scenarios are presented on the right under their best case scenario, which would be a, a dramatic or what we would characterize as a dramatic increase in the uh, control and monitoring measures in place, but uh, with the, ab the ability to relax some of the movement restrictions that are in place, that's the, the, the best case scenario on top. There's still an expectation for nearly uh, 100 million job losses in, in 2020 versus uh, just last year, about a 30% reduction in job losses compared to last year. Their baseline scenario with current conditions continuing, they're expecting about 100 million, or excuse me, 120 million job losses and their worst case scenario with many of the control measures failing and an increased uh, degree of, of movement restrictions. They, they expect up to 200 million um, job losses in 2020 compared to um, our 60% down from, from last year. The World Tourism and, or excuse me, the World Travel and Tourism Council is not necessarily um, as representative of many of the regions that FuseNet works in. However, we do expect that the trends that we see um, presented by this information are likely similar trends that we could expect to see uh, within the, the FuseNet monitoring regions of Central America, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, um, and Central Asia.
in our reporting over the last uh, couple of months, and as well as the reporting of partners in, in the news media, we've seen that um, the level of remittances has uh, increased in, in the summer uh, a little more than, than we might have expected in, in some countries. This chart here on the left is from the IMF, uh, looking at the level of remittances compared to December 2019 across um, the the countries that you that you see on the bottom, and we did see that as the restrictive uh, movement restrictions were set in place and the pandemic control measures were set in place, and as people um, across the globe were seeing the difficulty that that maybe some of their relatives and their their friends were facing. Um, there has been an increase in the level of remittances that have been um, sent in, in many countries compared to the decline that we saw at the beginning of the year. Uh, one of the expectations that, that many are, are positing with this increase that we're seeing in some places like in Central America um, and parts of East Africa is that those sending remittances are understanding the situation and the difficulty that the populations they're sending those remittances, remittances to are facing. However, there's a strong concern that um, the remittances being sent are coming out of savings in many cases, and that is very unsustainable, particularly in the economic climate that we're expected to face through the remainder of this year, at least, and potentially into next year. The chart on the right looks at the IMF's World Economic Outlook uh, growth pro projections. These are the updated projections from the summer. And one thing to note here, as you may have seen, is that in the revised uh, updated projections from the summer, there is a bit of a more pessimistic outlook from the IMF compared to the spring of this year, even though in the spring of this year, the IMF was already projecting somewhat of a downturn. Um, you may have also noticed that in um, public reporting on on these projections. There are many that still feel that the uh, projections from the IMF are still somewhat optimistic. Even if we take the uh, projections from the IMF, though, as they, they are here, we are expecting a, a global um, downturn in 2020, as we've all been expecting, um, that could be quite significant in many areas, as you see noted here, across the advanced economies in the north. And if we look, or excuse me, on the top of the chart, and if we look at, um, at the bottom half of the chart in the emerging mar markets and developing economies down in um, sub sub-Saharan Africa, two of the largest economies, Nigeria and Southern Africa, are still expected to experience uh, significant growth declines in 2020, and that is expected to translate into a constriction of households uh, ability to send these remittances, but also an increase in the demand potentially from households for these remittances to continue to support their lives. One of the data sources that we have been discussing um, in these briefings and in reporting is the information coming from the uh, high frequency World Bank LSMS surveys that began this summer. Um, new survey data is out for countries like Uganda, as you see here, as well as in um, Mali and Burkina Faso that we'll talk about. In Uganda, we're expecting that met much of the needs that the country is facing in terms of acute food insecurity is being driven um, by the restriction measures that have been in place on household access to uh, livelihoods, as well as um, seasonal performance in the country. And the chart here on the left from the, the World Bank and the Ugandan Bureau of Statistics survey that was conducted uh, shows the work stoppages by inter industry of the primary occup occupation of the person in the household. And we can see here in the dark blue and the light blue bars across the urban and rural population, some of the biggest decreases in uh, in, in work and in, in labor availability have been in the agricultural and the trade sector. Additionally, in some personal services sector, we're seeing large increases and then some more generalized um, decreases in employment across the other sectors noted here. The data for the uh, summer survey in June in uh, Mali is also uh, available at the moment from the World Bank. Um, unemployment due to the pandemic, as indicated uh, by the chart here on the right, uh, continues to decrease even into the summer of 2020 um, after the onset of the pandemic um, in West Africa. Uh, you can see that the level of unemployment in the blue bars in, in May, uh, while rather high across um, both national and urban center, national rural and urban centers of the country, um, has remained somewhat elevated uh, as we move into June as well. <laughs> 
in Nigeria, the third round of data is just published from the World Bank. And um, the chart here on the left looks at the level of employment. So this is not unemployment, but this is an em employment here. On the left, you can see uh, before March and then in the following groups of bars for the first round in April, May, the second round in June, and then in July. And this is broken down by the total population surveyed, urban populations, and rural populations as well. And one thing that's telling in this chart that we're uh, continuing to see in many other um, areas of the globe where we're working is that the, the level of employment by urban populations uh, remains lower than uh, those uh, reporting employment in, in rural populations. Malawi also has a couple rounds of data that have been published. The chart here on the top right is looking at the perception of threat to household finances from COVID-19. And as you can see, um, the chart doesn't start at zero. The chart starts at 80% and um, more than 90% of the poorest quintiles, the, the first poorest and the second poorest quintiles are reporting that the COVID-19 pandemic is having a substantial threat on their household finances in blue there. And then the change in employment status in Malawi is reported on the chart in the bottom. Uh, respondents stopped working in the blue bars uh, spread across national, urban, rural, and then male and female populations um, with the populations working in the, the dark blue circles at the top and then the respondents not working, who are already not working pre-pandemic in those blue circles in the middle. Ethiopia's uh, also been reporting on um, levels of household difficulty meeting um, income and food needs through their uh, ongoing COVID-19 high frequency survey with the World Bank and the National Statistics Service in Ethiopia. Um, we've been looking at the data in a little more detail in Ethiopia, given the high degree of variation in livelihoods and um, income and expenditure patterns across the country in Ethiopia with a very diverse livelihood system and a, a very large population. This data is from the second round that um, was collected in the summer. And as you can see from the chart on the left, the change in non-farm income uh, still remains less than usual for more than half of the population that was surveyed in Ethiopia. And the chart on the right provides an indication of the percent of job sector reporting losses uh, by, by job sector. And so you can see at the top, the transportation service is the job sector that has experienced the largest decline according to the survey in um, job availability or the largest job losses seen, followed by construction, manufacturing, um, and then restaurants and hotels, which we had, had touched on a little bit at the beginning of the presentation. Moving to our countries in focus, we wanted to start with West and Central Africa. Burkina Faso also recently released um, data through the National Statistics Service and the World Bank from their high frequency COVID-19 phone survey. And the first measure is looking at the awareness of government control measures in that top chart. Um, there's a high awareness of the closures and access to markets and places of worship, as well as curfews and bans on populations assembling at more than 50 people. Uh, the evolution of non-farm income sources is indicated in the chart in the bottom. And as you can see in the orange bar there, um, across all of the industries noted here in agriculture industry and the service industry, excuse me, there's been a greater than 50% um, or there's a greater than 50% of the survey population has indicated they're receiving lower incomes than they had uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and restriction measures. Additionally, in Mauritania, um, in particular, in other parts of the Sahel, while we are seeing generally favorable uh, pasture condition for livestock who are now migrating back with the, the near uh, completion of the rains in West Africa, some of the COVID-19 restriction measures and border closures are uh, hindering the ability of pastorals to move with their livestock. Um, we've seen this in Mauritania with livestock remaining in Mali and Senegal in some cases, as well as other areas in the Sahel. For remote monitoring in West Africa, FuseNet monitors Mauritania, Burkina Faso, and the Central African Republic. We might stop here and provide a reminder that for remote monitoring countries, uh, for FuseNet, while we don't have a presence in that country and monitor these remote monitoring countries uh, from a neighboring country, we don't also do subnational mapping for these countries. And the color that outlines the country indicates the highest area phase classification that we would expect to occur 
in that country. So for these maps in the August to September period, we expect that um, stressed outcomes are the highest outcomes we would be likely to see in Mauritania, and those outcomes would only be sustained by ongoing provision of humanitarian assistance by the national government and others. In Burkina Faso and the Central African Republic, we're expecting that crisis levels of acute food insecurity will exist in some areas. We would also flag that in West Africa, COVID-19 restriction measures are not necessarily the largest threat we're concerned about for acute food uh, insecurity outcomes, particularly in Burkina Faso and the Central African Republic. Uh, high levels of conflict continue with more than a million people displaced in Burkina Faso due to the conflict in the Lantapo Gorma region and the continued conflict that has um, been increasing and decreasing at very level, various levels over the last several years in the Central African Republic. Turning to East and Southern Africa, in East Africa, we, we monitor Rwanda as a remote monitoring country, and in Southern Africa, we monitor Lesotho as a uh, remote monitoring country. The chart here for Rwanda indicates the annual changes in urban consumer price index uh, since 2012. And as you can see here, there's been uh, a moderate degree of vo volatility in the consumer price index for urban areas in this blue line since um, May 2012 on the left there, with a notable increase that we've been seeing since this summer um, on the right hand side of the graph. And we are expecting, um, as we're receiving information from national partners in Rwanda, that much of this increase in the consumer price index and inflation in Rwanda has to do uh, with the the low levels of prices that we had been seeing in 2019 and not necessarily as highly reflective of just uh, uh, impacts from COVID-19 restriction measures in Rwanda. Prices are increasing somewhat uh, for staple foods in Rwanda as they are in Lesotho. In Lesotho, we are expecting that the increases to staple food prices are due to some disruption in the marketing systems, particularly with South Africa. Uh, while Lesotho did experience another poor agricultural season in 2020, um, South Africa did somewhat better, and we do expect that their exportable surpluses will continue to move into Lesotho, although with potentially some disruptions due to the ongoing movement restrictions. In both Rwanda and Lesotho, we're expecting that between August and September, uh, phase two would be the highest uh, phase experienced by areas in those two countries. As we move into 2021, however, we do expect that um, Lesotho will face crisis level outcomes in some areas as they move into the lean season, uh, which occurs between the end of the year and the, the first quarter, the first quarter of the year. I won't spend too much time on Central America um, as we will be getting a um, special briefing for uh, Central America and the Caribbean next week at the same time. Uh, however, we will note that the restrictive measures that are in place in El Salvador and Honduras in particular uh, to slow the spread of the virus are somewhat um, disjointed between sectors and services. Um, there's not a, a lot of continuity be, between sectors and services on the measures that are, are taking place there. And we do expect that, particularly in the dry corridor of Honduras and El Salvador, um, that casual workers are particularly impacted and poor populations in many areas uh, could be facing crisis outcomes. In Nicaragua, there is still a uh, somewhat disjointed government response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we have in many of the last briefings, we'll end on the global infographic for the um, 46 countries that FuseNet's providing estimates on for 2020 for peak needs estimates. Again, um, we're expecting in the 29 FuseNet reporting countries uh, that 90 to 100 million people require emergency humanitarian assistance in 2020 um, due to the pandemic and associated restrictive measures on household ability to access lives and livelihoods. <laughs>